so um, the talk today I'm giving it will be slightly different than what's on. Well, it's the content is the same, but the title is slightly different. So I will cover a lot what previous speakers have talked about, about but I will focus more on the big picture and about basically the evolution of where we come from and where we're heading. So real quick about myself, um, I'm, I was a former VP Biz Dev from Cloud Sigma and I've run startups before and currently running a startup. And so I've, I kind of got a pretty good sense of both the supply side and the demand side of the cloud industry. So, and uh, here are my contact details if you want to get a hold of me. I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Also, we'll repeat the slide afterwards. And also, since I currently do not work in any cloud company, I don't have any bias in terms of <laughs> sales pitches in terms of what you should use and should not use. Um, anyways, uh, this is the manager slide. So basically, the company I do right now, we, um, the most recent product, we do um, digital signage for the Raspberry Pi. You should check it out. It's awesome. You can turn the Raspberry Pi into a remote control screen uh, with about $35 piece of hardware and now software. So, all right, enough about the mandatory self pitch. So, what we will cover here is first of all, I'm going to walk over the X as a service layer. I think I might have a slightly different approach or interpretation of this than some of the other speakers today. Um, and I will view it more from the abstraction layer and how you see it from that way. Um, I will also go over some of the technologies that power them. will also be kind of repetitive to some of what the people have talked about, but I did not know the comp a lot of speakers beforehand. <laughs> uh, and then we talk about technologies and, and various orchestration layers that you can, can use in combination with this. So the way I like to look at these X as a service is really from like a abstraction spectrum. On the very bare, very bottom, you have kind of the, the bare metal, and the first layer is IaaS, and then on top of that is your pass and saw. So the bare metal would obviously be your colo gear in your in your data center or in your office for that sake. And then you have the IaaS, which is Google Compute, Amazon EC2, or Cloud Sigma for that sake. Um, and then you have a platform as a service, pass, which is your Google App Engine, Heroku, and all those guys, or if you have a private deployment, that would be your, say, Juju, Cloud Foundry, OpenShift, and all those guys. And on the very top, you have the SaaS layer, which is basically all the applications used on a daily basis, um, Twitter, Google Apps, Office 365, or whatever. Now, so what's really where I think it's interesting is how it pairs together with uh, the various spectrum of hardware. and. This is kind of a slide with, or a timeline that is not really true, but it's kind of where we're, how we've evolved to this point where we are today. And the reason why I say it's not really true is because all of these kind of coexist. So there's, I'm not by any means trying to make the argument that the mainframes are dead, because I gave this talk actually at Cloud Expo a few months ago, and some people bashed me on Twitter for saying that mainframes are dead. <laughs> and they are really actually not, because you can do some cool stuff. Uh, but the spectrum is really from mainframes moving on to kind of bare metal. And then came virtual machines came along. And that's kind of where we are today mostly. And that's where most, most of the workload tend to be deployed today. And in the most recent year or two is so we have seen the more shift towards containers. And as you can see above these, you have the IaaS layer being the virtual machines and the past layers being containers. And I guess that kind of contradicts what Sebastian said before, but it's kind of, it, it, I still see it this way, and I'll, I'll elaborate on that in a little bit. But let's, let's dive into all these different elements in the spectrum now. And so the mainframe is really where we start out, like the terminal server kind of uh, approach a long time ago. There are some significant benefits to them, and they're really powerful for the performance they're actually rather compact because you get a lot of power into a single one rack or how many racks you need of them. And they're also super reliable. I, I f a few times I actually run into consultants that still do consulting work around mainframes and they tell these stories where they run into companies and the companies have a mainframe system that they don't really know what it's been doing at all and it was acquired like 15 years ago. 
and then they unplug it and it turns out to be like a critical business operation running on that mainframe. And they didn't really even maintain it for 10 years and it's still been just sitting there working perfectly and nobody even been complaining until it broke down. There are obviously downsides with them too. They're kind of expensive. They're obviously not commodity hardware. At least previously also tend to be uh, rather static in terms of you build your system for this particular mainframe. You cannot actually move it between because you have some specific Unix version or whatever that you actually built this workload for. So you also then frequently need that a specific developer to develop this for it or you purchase from software that just ran this. And it was not very easy to just plug in somebody from the IT department and run it. So the next level then would be the, the bare metal kind of level. And one of the main benefits, I guess, is that it's very familiar. Most people have a, a computer on their desk, so they, they don't really feel too distant about that, right? Um, you get, compared to the level that we'll talk about further up in abstraction chain, you get very good performance. You're actually operating right on the metal, as the name implies, so there's no really overhead. <clears throat> There are also benefits in terms of data management because you actually own this physical piece of inventory. It sits in your rack or in your store in your storage at the office, whatnot. So you actually have full control over the data. The flip side on the other hand is that it's really difficult to provision changes to bare metal. Like it is what it is, more or less, unless you want to bring down the machine and add memory or whatnot. So it's, it's not really ideal for that purpose, and that's kind of what fed a lot of the uh, transition into virtual machines. You also tend to have a very low kind of utilization per host, because at least in traditional workloads, you usually had kind of one set of applications you ran on this bare metal, and that was it. You didn't really actually use um, that high density of application on a given server, because for many good reasons. So that takes us to virtual machines. And virtual machines really is where it kind of we are right now, of course, then. The main benefit is that it's really flexible. You can squeeze in a lot more workload onto the same server as you could do with, uh, as you could do, compared to what you could do with bare metal. So you get higher server utilization. You have also a very simple migration path from bare metal. It's really, I mean, there are a lot of tools out there. You could literally just take a piece of software that ports your physical bare metal over to a VM. So the migration path is very simple. Do you have also significant benefits with scalability? Now, this is more true if you're running in a public cloud environment, more so than if you're running in a private environment, because unless you have a very, very large deployment, you can usually not spin up a thousand VMs uh, in your own private cloud, unless you, yeah, unless you have a very large deployment base. On the negative side, on the other hand, you have a big problem with the noise and neighbor issue, which is basically means that somebody on that same physical host is consuming a lot of resources. And that's usually things like a VM that starts to swap or something that completely saturates the disks. And that impacts the performance that you have, which makes your performance really unpredictable. And that's kind of not great when you're actually running a production workload. Now, a lot of clouds um, have moved over to SSDs. And SSDs kind of tend to mitigate a lot of this because noise and neighbor, the noise and neighbor issue is mostly an issue with uh, on the disk, not so much on CPU and RAM, even though a lot of uh, some clouds over provision RAM and so on as well, so it could be an issue there to an extent. Um, so, yeah, you, but you do have an overhead compared to BAML on the actual physical host. So, because you are emulating software, there is a fairly significant overhead on running it, even though it's getting less, of course, over time. Um, it should also be mentioned as a negative for the management side of running VMs, because it is actually very complex still to, to maintain and manage a, an infrastructure, a cloud infrastructure today. It is true that on the proprietary side of things, it's easier, but it's by no means just like, here's your OpenStack deployment, then that's it. Uh, you will 
probably going to shoot yourself in the foot unless you have a lot of expertise in their area. So there's uh, definitely that. And another downside is, of course, if you're deploying in the public cloud, you do give up control over your data to an extent. Um, there are some, obviously, jurisdictional areas where you can deploy. Switzerland is a good example of that, of course, where that's less of an issue. But most of the public clouds out there are, they do have US holding companies. So even if you're deploying data in Switzerland, it doesn't really matter because they can still, someone could still get to your data if they needed to. Meaning, yeah, some, some governments if they need to. So, zooming in a bit about the technologies for then for the virtual machines. So, I've divided the slide into two elements. So, you have the upper side and the lower side. And this kind of, I would say, KVM on the open source side is really kind of what's basically that is the market more or less these days. The only reason why I get a feeling that like the reason why Zen is kind of around still is because um, Amazon is a big KVM shop, but uh, Zen shop. So that's kind of that's a huge part of the Zen deployment base. But it feels like my, my gut feeling from industry talking with people is that almost everybody deploys KVM these days. And on the commercial side, then the lower half of the slide, um, VMware tend to be the winner so far in the private deployment base. They definitely have a significant market share. But Microsoft is definitely paying attention to that. And they are seem to be gaining a lot of momentum actually with Hyper-V, largely because of pricing. Because they tend to undercut the market by, because VMware's pricing model is rather, well, it's not cheap. So a lot of companies have actually have second thoughts there and deployed Hyper-V instead. So that's, that's kind of the technologies that power these. So let's, let's dive a little bit into um, the different technologies then. So, or the management layers. And this kind of, this has been covered over the course of the day. It seems like on the open source side, OpenStack is kind of the volume as the winner there. Uh, that's, at least that's my take on it. But as Sebastian pointed out earlier, there, that may or may not be relevant and if we see this involvement towards uh, containers taking on even further. But there are others, other tools out there to pay attention to, such as uh, Libvirt, which is actually a very useful tool for interacting with them if you don't need the complexity of something like OpenStack or, or other open source libraries, because they're, they are by no means easy to maintain and set up. On the proprietary side, it tend to be baked in, so you don't really have to pay too much attention to that on the, on the proprietary side so much as you do have with uh, on the open source side. It's basically it's, it's what they offer you or, or nothing, more or less, usually. <clears throat> so that kind of takes us to containers. And this is somewhat repetitive on the, on the previous talk. But on that spectrum of containers, it's obvious there are some significant benefits to containers. They're fast. They're really easy to work with. They're predictable. You can move around. You can, you can build it locally and push it to Docker Hub and, and to then pull it down on any, more or less, any virtual machine around the world. And it's still going to work. So you know, there's really nothing, no uncertainty there at all. So it's very, very nice in that sense. One thing here is also that they tend to be easy to audit. And I think that's something that we should stress more because there are a lot of companies out there that have their golden images for various services. And nobody really knows what's in that golden image. They just like deploy it, and they know it works, but not exactly how it's set up, how, why it works, and so on. And that's kind of solved, at least with Docker, right, with all that technology is really around uh, containers. You can really just go back and look at the Docker file, for instance, and see exactly how this is set up. So you have an easy way to audit them uh, when you, or reproduce them and audit, I guess. There are some downsides, though. If you're a very conservative kind of enterprise setting, you probably not do not feel too comfortable about the rapid release cycles that you see there. It's really evolving fast. Um, I've, I've to, I have to update, like I've done a few talks on similar topics, and even if it's just a few weeks between the talks, you have to like update the deck because things have actually changed. So it's really, it's that fast, and if you're, really resistant to change and hesitant, it's probably not ideal. You might want to wait a few, wait a while until it kind of slows down. 
And on the other, another decade side is that there are no really good way of running them, running containers today without deploying something yourself. Uh, there are no really pauses out there that you can upload as a Docker file and run, to my knowledge at least. So that's, that's definitely something that I think once that's solved, it's going to be a lot easier. But there are good technical reasons for why that has not been done yet, and networking and, and so on is networking and storage are two big elements to that. So looking at the underlying technologies here with, uh, with, the, uh, with containers, and yes, containers are nothing new. Um, I, I ran, I used to be running BSD a lot, and I ran BSD jails 10 years ago, and it's really containers, so it's nothing new, and so Larry Stone has been doing it for a long time, so it's really nothing new. It's what Docker really did was to provide a really good way to consume it. So if we look a little bit on how they all tie together, so you have inside the Linux kernel, you have LXC and LXD containers. LX, LXC is what basically Docker is running, as well as Rocket, which is CoreOS re-implementation of Docker, really. And it's showing really good promise. We'll see how it evolves over the next few months or year or so. Uh, but it did solve some of the things that Docker didn't solve yet, so we'll see. But there's another thing to pay attention to in the spectrum as well, and, and that's LXD, uh, which is what Canonical is investing rather heavily in right now. And LXD is basically, well, their pitch is that it's going to be more secure and more lightweight. And it seems I saw some demos last week, and, and they seem to be getting really good performance out of it. But if it's going to really take off or not, that's, that's time. We'll, we'll see soon. <coughs> So, container operating system, right? This new breed of operating system. And this is exactly the same as we talked about in the previous talk. So, this is kind of repetitive, so, but I wasn't aware of that, obviously. Uh, CoreOS, I think myself, I find myself very, very exciting. Uh, what they have done is, is really, really fantastic. And the reason why it is fantastic is because it makes itself irrelevant in, from an end user's perspective. And that's, that's kind of the cool part. You have this self-managing operating system because, let's face it, nobody likes waking up at 3 in the morning to fix, patch a server. It's much nicer if the system can take care of it itself. And that's kind of what CoreOS set out to do, while also providing you what you do really care about, which is essentially just a robust runtime environment. Because what you care about is not exactly how your system is running. All you care about is your runtime environment is up and running. And that's kind of the overarching goal with these all these uh, container wrapping systems. It's just bare metal, bare, bare enough to run your workload, and that's it. So that's, that's really cool. And so CoreWiz is probably the one that I'm most excited about right now. But there's also, there are also all these other projects with Snappy Core. And Snappy Core is doing some other cool things too, but it's basically, it seems like they all got really born out of when CoreOS started to take off. They kind of really excel. They probably start to really speed up the development once that was the case. But it is, it is nonetheless good. But I think CoreOS seemed to be catching a lot of momentum, in particular with their partnership with uh, Google. So they, they partnered up with Google on Kubernetes. So orchestration then for, uh, for containers. You can basically use all your existing provisioning tool, your configuration management tool. All of them support basically all, all of them support more or less containers. So that's really nothing new there. But what's more exciting, I think, is just Kubernetes because that's really that solved all those issues, moving around workloads, and it kind of overlaps a little bit with core, with what CoreOS does built into the system. But it does nonetheless. Both of them solve the problem really well. So what I would pay attention to is certainly Kubernetes, as well as um, some of the built-in tools in Docker are nice as well. They have Swarm and Compose. So, but I, I would say Kubernetes is probably the one that's likely to evolve as a winner for uh, orchestration of containers. But then again, there are, there are a gazillion other ones here, um, and including Microsoft and VMware investing in, in being able to run these systems baked in. So that kind of takes us back to this last slide here with, or not last slide, but this slide with uh, 
the iOS, iOS, and container layer. So that's why I kind of would argue that containers is kind of the equivalency of, or it should be considered a pass layer. So we're going to walk over a little bit here uh, in, in about the pass system then. And there are significant benefits to pass in general. And the most beautiful thing with the pass system in general, I would say, is that with literally within a few lines of code, you can have your application up and running, and you don't really have to care about it. And I, I remember the first time I used Heroku, I was blown away how easy it was. And it's really, it's really nice. So it's a turnkey solution. You just get up and running. You don't have to care about it much. And, and scalability and all that, that's, that's their problem. It's not your problem. So that's, that's really nice, in particular if you actually have a deadline to meet. There are downsides, though. All, most, almost all of these paths on the market, they kind of have their own SDK that you work with. So you can't really move from one to another. Some of them you can run uh, between a private deployment or a public deployment, but you're still like locked to that kind of that pass. So that's kind of that's the downside. And generally speaking, when you're scaling up, it becomes expensive. That's kind of how they make their money. At least Heroku and those guys, they they make their money from you getting locked in early on, and then when you scale up, it becomes really expensive, and you're you have more important things to do than to migrate away from it. So I guess that's kind of part of their business model. But nothing wrong with that. So what are these passes that are available today? I mean, this is probably just a subset of the passes out there. And I think Juju, the one that I would, that I find most exciting right now at least to work with is Juju is showing really important, imp impressive potential. And you now Canonical is investing really heavily in it. So I think that's something to really pay attention to, even though Cloud Foundry has been around for longer. I still think Juju is really, I think, Ubuntu, uh, Canonical can really do some interesting thing with Juju. And on the commercial side of things, and um, yeah, by the way, both all of the ones on the upper spectrum, you can usually get both commercial and as a whole, uh, or uh, running your own. But on the commercial side of things, Heroku, Google App Engine, and App Engine, uh, Google App Engine and Engine Yard, they're all still in the game, but it seems like Google App Engine is definitely catching on more and more. We're out, and Heroku as well, whereas and New York have somewhat kind of, I don't know, we don't hear too much talk about them anymore. So that seems to be the, those seem to be kind of the winner in the spectrum here on the pause side. But that kind of begs the question then, so pause versus containers, they're really kind of the same, aren't they? The only way you, the only difference really how you talk to the system or how you set it up. So that's kind of, it's a strange relationship and for instance, Do, uh, for instance, uh, Heroku run all their pass applications or the application that uses running inside LXC containers, not Docker containers, but LXC containers. So it's kind of, they already do that. So the question is then, won't we really be, won't the Docker file become the kind of standard pass layer and kind of make a way that, lo do away with that locket? So that's really what I would hope to see. And I think, I think we're heading in that direction, at least, in particular with Kubernetes. And currently, you cannot do that at Google, even with, you can kind of, they have a beta service that you can run Kubernetes, but it's still on your own VMs. It's not like run these containers. But I think time, given time, I think that we'll see, that is where we'll be heading in general. So that's kind of my kind of thinking at that of pass versus containers. So that brings us to the very kind of last and trends that I, at least I see. And that's the first line here is obviously nothing new that's been talked about for ages, it feels like. But microservices is where we're heading. And if you were to write something today, that's obviously kind of what you should be doing and have in mind from the very early on. But, but more important, I think, is, that's, is this idea of ephemeral runtime environments where you have really no persistent data at all uh, in the actual containers that you run, and you use external services for that. So that's really something that we see more and more, and it's becoming really essential when you start run and scale up. So that's something that designing that from early on and, and help will save you trouble down the road, and it's not necessarily more difficult to do. So that's something we've done that. We've done a mistake ourselves, so it's something that we should, that we, we would have done differently if we redesigned it from today. From today. 
And this notion of self-managing systems like CoreOS and that guys, I think that's an interesting trend. I think we definitely, because at the end of the day, you, like I said before, you really don't care as a developer or as a ops guy if you, if what this exactly underlying system is, you really just care about running your particular app. So I think that's a healthy trend in the market that we are moving towards thinking more about Docker's containers or containers in general, just be this kind of runtime environment that can move between servers. And the server itself is kind of irrelevant. All you really care about is it's up and running and the performance is good. That's really, that's all really all that matters to you. And we have definitely, the containers are definitely here to stay. And there's no doubt about that. We will see which one will evolve as the winner. It seems to be like Docker is the one, even though a lot of people a lot smarter than me are criticizing it for a lot of good reasons. And there are a lot of flaws in it right now, but I think it seems like it's, they will be winning. And I think we'll still see more and more hybrid setups. And when I say hybrid setups, I don't talk about the traditional hybrid setups, which are usually thought about as bare metal and VMs, but rather VMs and containers living together, as well as, as uh, possibly bare metal. So I think that's where we're heading in general, and that's kind of, uh, that's kind of my, the trends that I see in the market right now. So. So that's kind of um, 26 minutes, so a few minutes of a question if there are any. And uh, here are my details. Feel free to reach out to me on Twitter if you have any questions. Uh, if not, or connect to me on LinkedIn. So yes, 